Mr. Chairman, friends. I am somewhat daunted here when I see the extraordinarily capable men and women who are participating in this uh, discussion. Some of them are iconic figures who make a phenomenal difference to this country. <coughs> I am also daunted by the fact that in Mumbai city I am wearing a jacket and tie. Uh, there is nothing like winter in the city, we all know. But then when I gave a thought this morning whether or not I should support this, the only reason why I occasionally I support this is I have them and there is no justification of having them <laughs> unless you wear them once in a while and they live until it's a good place. But I knew that Justice Venkatachari would certainly support the jacket and tie. So I knew that I would have always come to me. Um, friends, that there is something that we need to do in the realm of rule of law is self-evident. I don't think we need to discuss that, persuade each other. So I'll skip much of that. Except that I'll try and spend a couple of minutes establishing the linkage between the failure of rule of law and many, many things that we see around us which are completely unpalatable. Long ago, Pastor Niemöller, he said, man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible. But he also admonished, man's inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. In many ways, a deep understanding of what Nimola was trying to say is at the heart of the democratic debate throughout the world. Without our sense of justice, there is no democracy. Without democracy, there is no justice. Because fundamentally, each of us as human beings and all of us as society are prone to both the propensity to justice and the inclination to injustice. Let us never forget that. And clearly, in a society where, despite creating a reasonably sound foundation of rule of law through the constitution of this country, we haven't done as well as we should. I would not like to paint a very dark, bleak picture that's neither warranted nor desirable. But certainly, we all recognize the deficiencies. Let me simply make one case. All of us know that, but still I think it requires some iteration. Criminalization of politics, we are also deeply concerned about it. In fact, one of uh, my very significant uh, items of work over the years has been identifying criminals in politics. Uh, when we did it for the first time in India in 1999, many people did not believe that we would be able to do it and live to tell the tale. We identified 42 criminals contesting elections in Andhra Pradesh. These were not ordinary criminals. These are not big pockets and miners and stuff. These are people who committed 13 or 15 murders, people who made hundreds of crores of rupees, people who were significant figures in contemporary politics, people who had won both houses of parliament and the state assembly and became ministers. So we're talking of big stuff. So when we came out with that list, most people believed that these chaps would not survive. But we survived. We survived because the political system understands two of the elements. We are all complaining and criticizing and attacking all the time, but we haven't really gone into the roots of the problem. Why is there criminalization of politics in India? Let me give you four reasons. The first question is, why are criminals respected in society? I dare to argue that there is actually a market demand for criminals in this country. If the criminals do not exist, we create them. I do not know if you all recall, but I remember a case, I may be somewhat fuzzy about the details, the case of a metropolitan magistrate in Mumbai city, a district judge, a sessions judge, who was dismissed from service, if you remember, some years ago, because he went to the mafia. But for what reason? 
because his family lent a sum of some 30 or 40 lakh rupees to somebody. They could not recover the money by ordinary means. And being a judge, and pardon me sir, all of you Justice Dharmadkari and Justice Makatacharya uh, and Justice Suresh and others, being a judge, he knew full well that through the law courts he could never ever recover that money. And therefore he went to a higher court, namely the Mafia in Mumbai. Now it's easy for us to castigate him, dismiss him, do all kinds of things. Eventually, incidentally, uh, the criminal courts of this country, in this city, have exonerated him of a crime, by the way. He was only dismissed from the judiciary, but he was only recently, if I recollect, exonerated by the criminal laws of the criminal courts of this country, because they realized he did what any ordinary Indian would do in a desperate situation. We have created an incredibly lousy situation. We have created a situation in which the Gunda has become the undeclared church. We have created an institutional climate in which rough and ready justice through brutal means if necessary, through coercion, <coughs> is about the only means that's available to an ordinary citizen. If you do not set that right, you cannot control criminalization of society in the first place. Second, why are these criminals then entering politics? After all, the criminal made a lot of money and uh, is quite respected in his community. Why should he enter politics and then invite the wrath of all these Chola Wallas and activists and Sailor Gandhis and, and Jai Prakash Narayans and, and uh, invite a program of, um, of many, many people? And of course, the judiciary will come down very heavily on them because there is a an incredible magnet at work. <coughs> Once you enter politics, the policeman who should typically scare you in a sensible society and in some cases frighten you if there is an up the chapel kind of environment. I'm sure you all remember that film. They are absolutely scared of a politician. The moment you enter politics, the same Gonda can scare the wits out of politics, the policeman because he determines their careers, their posterings, their placements. And what more security and protection and strength does a criminal have than having a policeman on his side? Therefore, they're doing a very smart. Entering politics is a very natural corollary in a system where the crime investigation system is entirely under the control of the political process. Then, of course, third and fourth questions are political. They're a little outside the realm of our discussion, but I briefly mentioned them anyway, whether it is. The third is, why are politicians inviting these criminals? Men and women like Manmohan Singh, L.K. Adwani, <coughs> many, many decent people, Nitish Kumar. These are very decent people. Whatever you and I say about them, just because they're in politics, it's easy for us to revile them. These are very decent and humane persons. Why do they invite them? Do you know that even Nitish Kumar has had a significant number of people in criminal record in this recent election, let alone the other election? Because the politician is desperate to win. We have created a wretched situation in which it is generally believed, and also it's generally true, that vast amount of money power, muscle power, and cast cloud together are the ingredients of electoral success. When I won in Andhra Pradesh, it was regarded as a mini miracle. It was generally said in Andhra Pradesh, and perhaps in much of the rest of India, that if a Mahatma Gandhi today contested an election, because Gandhiji would contest only his way, no money, no liquor, no false promises, no inducements, no nothing, the general belief was that Mahatma Gandhi would lose his deposit. <laughs> in such a climate, the politician or the political parties seek criminals and very happily reward them with political promotion because they bring three crucial ingredients. They have the muscle power by definition. They acquire a formidable amount of money through their criminal career. And almost every criminal who made it big in politics is also a caste leader, a community leader. Please remember that. Your own 
your own Chota Rajan and your own many other people who are actually a very secular criminals coexisting peacefully with all kinds of communities. But the moment they became political, they have, they have uh, thrown themselves in this garb of this community that will be the champions of the community. I can cite an umpteen number of cases where notorious gangsters who coexisted very peacefully and harmoniously became fierce rivals and grounds of caste of region and religion in order to enhance their political appeal. And once they have these three qualities together, they become very formidable political figures. And of course, finally, why are we, the folks of Mumbai or Hyderabad or Chennai or the villages of India, why are we electing them? It's not always because of fear, it's not always because of inducement. It's because we created a wretched system where almost nothing seems to happen without coercion. If a nice guy gets elected, almost nothing gets done. People are frustrated. If a gunda is elected, almost certainly he will threaten somebody, probably somebody into submission and get something done. In the process, he may also please the state, the Indian state, the people of this country, it doesn't matter. But he gets something done. So my appeal to all of us here, you are extremely enlightened in terms of your understanding, your concerns, your approaches and aspirations. My appeal to all of you is, please look a little deeper. Do not look at the symptoms all the time, because I am sick and tired in this country of the description of what's wrong with India. We require a deeper understanding of why it is wrong and how to set it right. And that's why I raise these four issues. Each of them is available to a specific institutional response, believe me. Because we are no different from neither society. What's happening in India in judiciary or in police or in politics or elsewhere has happened and is happening in most parts of the world. So despair and cynicism are extremely dangerous and utterly counterproductive. It's in that spirit that I think we should look at specific institutional responses. Therefore, I am now receive my brief, Mr. Chairman, if you permit me brief. What are the things we can do? I personally believe we are actually very lucky as a country. Despite the enormous mess, despite the phenomenal and clear failures in the country in many sectors, we have been blessed with a very liberal constitution and the constitutional organs and authorities that served us very well. The founding fathers are very extremely wise. Of course, they come into some mistakes, but on the whole, we've been very lucky. When we look at the country's judiciary today, whether it is the Ayodhya case, and I don't care what's the verdict and the piece of real estate in the Supreme Court or what happened already in the Allahabad High Court, the outcome is not so important. But the process, the fact that the people of India said, look, let us trust the courts. Let's not lose our shot about this piece of real estate. Of course, it happened after 15, 20 years of strife and bloodshed and stupidity, yes. But they still decided that they will leave it to the judicial process. Look at Kuji's spectrum. What are we the problems? We have today an institution which is able to wrap the knuckles of a union minister or the government of India, and quite rightly so. Look at uh, caste reservation. Somebody sent a slip saying, please answer this question. Now, without the Supreme Court bringing some amount, amount of balance, sanity in this country, where would we be? There would be a caste war in this country. We have to harmoniously reconcile conflicting interests. And the political process has singularly failed. Unless the judiciary steps in, even if it's only in the interim, we simply have no future as a country, as a united entity. I'm making an extremely sharp point. India's unity is in mortal danger today, thanks to our third rate politics. We require a holding operation. We require some institutional mechanism to help us tide over at least the next 10, 15 years so that eventually, hopefully, we have enough maturity and wisdom as a people to set out our institutions and preserve and 